name. We bless your name. Uh, we are thankful uh, for giving us life. We are thankful for sustaining us. Thank you for upholding us with your righteous right hand. Thank you, Father, for every situation that we have been through. And you have won for us because you are victorious. We are thankful as we come to an end of this series, this discussion, on preparing the next generation for entrepreneurship. Thank you, Father, that you have been teaching us wonderful things that are marvelous in our sight. And I pray that they won't only remain for our sight or our hearing, but also for our, our doing, our execution. And you receive all the glory. You receive all the honor. We welcome your presence as we bring this to a close, as we today, as we look into the rewards of preparing the next generation for entrepreneurship. Would you give us knowledge? Would you give us understanding with this knowledge? And then would you help us carry it out each in our different spaces, in our different circumstances or situations. But may we achieve that which brings glory and honor to your name. May we be able to do excellently um, as you lead us for those that look up to us, for those that you have put in charge of their lives. Lord, may we humbly lead them as you show us the way and may we all enjoy the rewards of obedience we thank you we welcome your presence holy spirit that you would indeed um, be the teacher in this space in jesus name amen Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Grace Mutunga and this is Altar in the Marketplace. We meet every Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 8 a.m. And we're thankful that you're here um, from wherever you're viewing us or listening to us from whichever part of the world, we are so thankful you're here. Thank you very much for coming. Now, we have been discussing um, preparing the next generation for entrepreneurship. And today we are bringing it to a close. It's been a four week, uh, four weeks discussion um, in which we took it bit by bit. In week one of this month, we sought to um, understand for application the words prepare, next generation, and entrepreneurship. We looked at those three words, their definitions, how to apply them. We even looked at biblical applications. Um, of these three words, how men and women of old prepared, um, you know, each one their own next gen. Um, some of them were not really, you know, their flesh and blood. For some of them, it was, you know, a stranger from the community or whoever offered to be. Um, to, you know, to take that position. Whoever young person was available for preparation, for mentorship, for coaching, we looked at various men and women who succeeded in all this. In week two, we sought to answer that great toddler's question. 
why why do i need to prepare um, my next generation for entrepreneurship and our case study we 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 our case study next gens were Nadia and Nehemiah or Neil. So because of a time ahead, why prepare? Because of a time ahead in which their life and path uh, will come upon a chance that has been awaiting them because God's timing meets opportunity to create favorable advantageous combinations of circumstances um, so that by the time that is happening they have they're already armed with preparation because opportunity is an open door through which Nadia and Neil might gain a favorable return and we studied various biblical examples of the same. In our third week, we looked at, that was last week, how to prepare Nadia and Neil for what? To conceive an idea that is enterprisal, to develop that idea, to organize that idea, to run with that idea patiently, and to deliver that idea to a profitable reality. And um, we looked at how, you know, how, which areas to develop Nadia and Neil in the area of systematic disciplines, spontaneous ability, being supportive, being sacrificial and being spiritual. Those are the five areas how to help prepare Nadia and Neil for the future, prepare them in these five ways. And in these five ways, what areas do we narrow down on? And we just looked at three areas. One, prepare them for dominion or prepare them for responsibility. We looked at those two words as interchangeable. Uh, prepare them for relationship. And number three, prepare them for fruitfulness. And today we're going to look at the rewards of each of these three. When you prepare Nadia and Neil, for dominion or for responsibility? What are the rewards of that? When we prepare Nadia and Neil for relationship, what are the rewards therein? And when we prepare um, Nadia and Neil for fruitfulness, what are the rewards therein? Now, we begin with the rewards of responsibility or the rewards of dominion. Um, there are two other words you could use for this portion of study, the rewards of management or the rewards of stewardship. And in summary, we said dominion or responsibility or management or stewardship is a godlike credential. So if you are a steward to a certain extent, if you are a manager of whatever extent, whatever nature, wherever you are, if you bear a certain responsibility, then you are indeed a bearer of this godlike credential. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 to 30, we see the location of a story, the setting of a story which Jesus told, where all characters reside in this one space. Um, the second location is a far, far, far away country. And the third location is outer darkness. Now, 
this is the story of um you know the three servants that were given alone by their master who was traveling so let me turn there matthew 25 matthew chapter 25 um from verse 14 and there's a series of parables before and after uh, triggered by a question the disciples asked. In this part, Jesus talks about how the kingdom of heaven can be understood. He gives an illustration of the kingdom of heaven. And he says there was a man, a story of a man who was going on a journey far, far, far away. Now, the master or the man in this story, who is the master or the Lord, uh, goes on a trip and it looks like he's likely to be away for a long, long time. It's a long stay trip. Um, he was a wealthy master and he was also full of wisdom. And packing up his wealth to take it with him was not an option. It seems he had been studying his servants over a period of time, because when it was time for the trip, instead of packing up his trip, you know, and moving with it, what he did is he allocated his servants, at least three of them that are mentioned, um, his wealth. He gave them management of his wealth. He left them dominion. He gave them dominion of his wealth each one of them according to their abilities as probably he had been studying them. Now, to one servant, he gave them uh, five bags of gold based on that servant's, the first servant's display of preparedness. To the second servant, he gave two bags of gold based on that servant's display of preparedness from the past over time. And to the third servant, he gave one bag of gold. The results, immediately the first servant invested his portion, his five bags of gold, and soon it doubled to 10 bags of gold. Servant number two, right away, invested his portion, put it to work, and soon it doubled to four bags of gold. Servant number three, he opened a pit account with a safety deposit box in it, and soon it remained out of sight, far from any effect. Eventually, the master returned and called the servants in to give an account of, you know, how they had taken care of his wealth, how they had managed the wealth he left them. Remember, it was his, it was the master's wealth. And they were to give an account of how they took responsibility of it. We'll begin with the third servant who the consequence of his failure to take responsibility, to do something, to manage this wealth and bring it to a profitable reality. His poor stewardship skills, informed perhaps by his disrespectful opinion and profile, mental profile, of his boss, of his master, and him. Number one, a distant title. When he was called in to account for his wealth and all the things he said over there, uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 14, uh, down there from verse uh, 24, the king, the Lord said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. Imagine, that was his title now. Previously, he was just a servant. That was neither here nor there. But now he's earned himself the title, wicked and 
lazy servant. Can you imagine a new Anadia that is not prepared for entrepreneurship? This is their title. Number two, he earned himself a severe scolding. You read that story and you'll see how angry the master was. He earned himself a confiscation of what was entrusted to him. Remember the one bag of gold? That was taken away from him because um, the Bible says to those that use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But to those who are unfaithful, even what little they have will be taken away. And then he was given a new status, but downwards, he was made an outcast. Can you imagine? He was made an outcast. The Bible says in verse 30, he said, now throw this useless servant, that's what the Lord, the master said, into outer darkness. You know that third location? Throw him into outer darkness. He's now an outcast where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In Proverbs chapter 19, I found this scripture very interesting. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 1, verse 4, and verse 7. Verse 1 says, it is better to be poor and honest than to be a fool and dishonest. Verse 4 says, wealth makes many friends. Poverty drives them away. And verse 7 says, if the relatives of the poor despise them, how much more will their friends avoid them? The poor call after them, but they are gone. Imagine, this is what happened to this third servant. But let's look at the reward of taking dominion, the reward of taking responsibility. These are the rewards of Nadia and Neil, like the first and the second servant. When they take management, when they take the place of management, when they display stewardship through preparation. The two servants, each from this story, conceived an idea that was enterprising. They developed that idea. They organized that idea. They ran with that idea patiently. Remember the master was away over time. So they did have time and they delivered that idea as we see on the day of giving account. They delivered that idea to a profitable reality. And what was their reward from their master? Well, number one, praise from the master. Praise from the master. And now, if you've probably been in employment, a corporate or a small business, or maybe a partnership or something, you know the feeling of receiving praise from, you know, a job or a work you have done so well. It comes with a great feeling in there. Number two, they received an intimate title. They now shifted from servant, just mere servant like everyone else, and moved they were given an intimate title. The master said of them, each of the two, the first two, my good and faithful servant. He drew them closer to himself. Number three, they received promotion to a higher, uh, to higher and more added responsibilities because they displayed their ability. Number four, they received a share holder um, um, place in the master's joy, in the master's estate. Whatever gave him joy, 
they became shareholders in that space, in that part as well. And number five, they received ownership of confiscated goods or services. At least that's what happened to the first servant. He is the one who was on the receiving end of what was confiscated. These are the rewards of Nadia and Neil when we prepare them for dominion in entrepreneurship, taking responsibility right from home, right from that space in class, whether junior or senior higher learning, right from internship. These are the rewards of such. Now, let's look at the reward of relationship, a godlike lifestyle. And we go to the book of Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 from verse 11 to 32. This is a story Jesus tells of a lost relationship. But then it was found, the lost son, the parable of the prodigal son. A man had two next generation sons, okay? Now the kingdom principle is such that a good man leaves an inheritance to, uh, to his children's children. That's in Proverbs chapter 12, I mean chapter 13, verse 32. But in this story, the daddy is in the making of a good man. We see that because he already has wealth enough to share out between these two sons. He already does at this point. Now, uh, his younger son decided adamantly to break protocol and made an unusual and an untimely demand to his dad. Very unusual, very untimely. He ignored the fact that his dad had not yet left. He had not yet died. And the younger son made a demand of his share of his inheritance from his dad. Now, this was no ordinary request. So in my thinking, the dad probably took some time, you know, to try and guide his son out of this misguided thinking, misguided demand. But the boy was adamant. He would have it no other way. And soon the dad gave him his share of his inheritance. Then no sooner was he given than he packed up his goods and all he was given, and he left for a far, far away country. His spendthrift uh, spend lifestyle left him totally wasted out after some time. And probably it was a short time because of this kind of lifestyle. Worst of all, it was during a time of famine in the land. He then, <clears throat> this young man, having spent everything, he then conceived the idea to convince a local farmer to hire him to feed his pigs. After that, the idea developed to the point that the pig food looked good for this young man to eat as it was for the pigs. He probably attempted to reorganize this idea uh, you know, to get a different kind of source of food, but no one gave him anything. You read the text and you'll see all what I'm saying. And number four, it seems that he remained put in this situation, in this space, patiently enduring, patiently, patiently, because when patience had finished her work, the young man, number five, finally came to his senses. And the first words to himself made sense. For the first time, he made sense in a long, long time. 
he started thinking and conversing profitably to himself, all by himself. His rewards were humility. You see this result. He humbled himself. He thought about the servants back home living a better life than him. He pursued. He started putting one foot in front of the other in pursuit of reconciliation. He found expectation far, far away waiting for him was his father looking out on the path for his return. There was love and compassion and embrace when he arrived home from his dad. He, there was repentance. All this happened as a result of relationship. There was justification. Yes, he repented. His dad, however, was busy calling for a ring for him and a coat over him and sandals. There was justification from his dad. There was restoration. Let's party. My son who was dead is alive. My son who was lost is found. And these are words he said to his older son, his brother, the brother of this young man. There was reunion. The family was put back together again. There was a rebirth. All of these are ingredients for success in networking, in training, in mentorship and coaching as found in Luke chapter 6, 40. In marketing as found in Luke chapter 21, verse 15. In human resource as found in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. In investment as found in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 in partnership as found in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. The rewards of relationship, a godlike lifestyle. And finally, the rewards of fruitfulness, a godlike outcome. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 to 29, we've repeated this scripture a lot. We are commanded by Father God. Man is commanded by Father God to be fruitful. It's a command first. And then Father God enables, he makes it possible. He releases an enabler for us to fulfill this commandment. But over time, things fall apart. But the last Adam, Jesus Christ was sent and came to make this command doable with ease. How? In John chapter 15, verse 1 to 16, Jesus uses a simple illustration of crop farming. Check out this, uh, check out a plantation of grapes. You see the vine, the vine, singular, that's Jesus. You see the branches, plural, that's you and me and all of us, each of us. And then you see the gardener, singular, that's Father God. And then you see our favorite part. And well, this is the fruit, singular, the fruit, the fruit of the spirit. The fruit is hanging from you and me, the branches. But does that mean we are the producer? You are the producer of the fruit? I am the producer of the fruit as the branch? No. Let's put it this way. While I was growing up, while you were growing up, in our young years, did we produce teeth? by the act of pulling them down or pulling them up? 
did we grow in height overnight by an act of stretching ourselves or, or pulling ourselves up? No, we did not. It was not our doing that caused us to grow up till where we are. The same thing, the spirit, um, when we stay connected as branches to the vine, only then shall we bear much fruit, not just few, but much fruit. The consequences of being a branch that bears no fruit, oh, that branch is cut off. It is separated from the vine, the branch, not the vine, the branch that doesn't bear fruit. When Neo and Nadia do not bear fruit, they are cut off from the vine. That branch is gathered with other like branches. And then that branch, together with other like branches, are all burned. But what are the rewards of bearing the fruit of the spirit? Remember Galatians um, chapter 5, verse 22, and the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, gentleness, and self-control. What are the rewards? of bearing fruit, the fruit of the spirit. Number one, divine security for continuous and regular fruit output. Divine security in this area to continue doing it. Um, number two, opportunity to produce much fruit. All this is in John chapter 15, verse one to 16. In verse five, we see number two, opportunity to produce much fruit. Number three, verse seven and verse 16, assurance of answered prayer. When we bear fruit, when Nadia and Neil bear fruit, they are assured of answered prayer. Number four, verse eight, it brings great glory to Father God, the gardener, when we bear fruit, when Nadia and Neil bear fruit, when they are fruitful. Number five, verse 16, quality assurance of the fruit that lasts, that this is fruit that has uh, you know, that last, that has longevity or, <laughs> yeah, longevity. And number six, Galatians chapter five, verse 23, living a life that is above the legal requirements or legal standards. The Bible says in Galatians chapter five, verse 23, after naming the fruit of the spirit, that of these, of these, there is no law against the fruit of the spirit. In conclusion, fruitfulness is the eventual profitable reality to Nadia and Neil in the process of entrepreneurship. You may be asking, why not just prepare Nadia and Neil for business? Why pursue entrepreneurship? Why not just, you know, plain old business? Why? Well, Nadia and Neil have been created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. They therefore carry God-likeness in them. They are able to function like God in coming up with new ideas as we see in Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two. You see, God knows the plans he has for each Nadia and for each new. He knows we may not have the full knowledge of their plans from God, why they were here, 
why they were sent, what is their purpose, what's their path. We may see only in bits and pieces, but Father God has the full plan. Each one has their own God-given abilities and gifts. And God expects that Nadia and Neil's gift, each one, their own gift will be stirred up. Uh, 2 Timothy verse 1 to 6, stir up the gift from God in you. Stir it up. Stir up that gift of Nadia. Stir up that gift of Neil, which God sent them on earth with and for. When Nadia and Neil's gift from God is not stirred up, we are likely to add to the list of businessmen. You know, replication. But when we keep ablaze the gift of Nadia and Neil, the gift of God in them, we are likely to achieve, to realize the kind of diversity we see in God, um, in God's Genesis chapter one and chapter two enterprise. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask for all of us that are tuned in, that have been a part of this fellowship, that are a part of this fellowship, that are of influence in one way or the other to various Nadias, to various news of different walks of life uh, from whichever part of this, uh, you know, earth, from whichever part of this world, Lord, I ask that for each of us, you will help us. You will help us to pursue this calling in our lives, this noble work that you have given us to prepare young ones for entrepreneurship, for service to you. By stirring up your gift in them, show us how to give us wisdom, show us exactly how to bit by bit, piece by piece. We may not say everything together, but enable us by faith, by faith, by faith to make one step at a time, one step at a time and not giving up in preparing young ones for entrepreneurship, raising the bar to entrepreneurship, pursuing entrepreneurship, knowing that business is not a bad idea at all. It's not a bad place, but not settling just for business, but for a higher calling, the calling of being enterprisal, just like you, our father, as we see in Genesis chapter one and chapter two. We have your gift in us. Our children have your gift in them. Show us, Lord, how to stir it up, how to fan it up, how to set it ablaze, that you would be glorified and that we would enjoy the amazing rewards and benefits together with our children and our children's children for generations to come in our communities, in our families, in our nations, in our continents, on this earth. We thank you, Lord. We praise your name for the end of this season. We ask, Lord, that you set us off to this good work. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you and watch over you and cause you to prosper in this endeavor. God bless you.